Und wir kommen jetzt zum Vortrag von Oliver. Ähm, der hat was beruflich mit Weltraum zu tun, habe ich mir sagen lassen. Und entsprechend hat er einen Vortrag vorbereitet, wie man Satelliten hackt. More, more or less. Hi, I'm Oliver. Um, who of you has uh, heard of Starlink? That's great. Who of you has played with a Starlink? Oh, one? That's not a lot. All right, uh, so uh, that's why I think it's a good uh, time to, to talk about uh, what's happening in space and uh, what the next frontier, uh, not only from a technology perspective, but also for the hacker community uh, might look like. So yeah, we're talking about things that uh, may go boom and it's exciting times and everyone uh, that's following uh, also what's happening with SpaceX but also the greater space uh, theme uh, uh, is quite excited uh, what's happening right now. Really interesting times. So what's my motivation for, for being here? So uh, I I'm, have long time contacts uh, with CCC, even though I'm not a member, uh, even though the Bürgerhaus I'm sp uh, Eidelstedt, I'm Spittel, no, Eidelstedt. Uh, so, uh, long time ago, uh, uh, so I know a bit what I'm doing. Um, but what took me here is uh, that I did some testing. Uh, part of my job uh, for a client, uh, and I looked at uh, how how does this thing perform? How, how does a Starlink work when it's in motion? And uh, yes, we even have uh, Autobahn uh, that look like uh, uh, railways. Um, so uh, you make draw your own conclusions uh, what that means. So I uh, filled my car, had a, a Starlink uh, mounted to it and uh, looked at uh, how can we uh, quantify what's going on, especially when that thing is in motion. So basic setup, uh, uh, took the data there, measured power, uh, put that uh, in a time series database, graphed it a little. Um, uh, so uh, n nothing uh, super uh, strange and serious, but uh, the outcome was quite interesting. So uh, just a as an example, I, I saw that the uh, performance of that thing uh, was surprisingly good. And uh, so the ping performance uh, when you're driving at German Autobahn speed, even when uh, this overhead power line is moving over that thing, uh, is really good and uh, very often beats uh, what's happening in the mobile world. Um, so y you can see uh, throughput, uh, uh, and this is not an advertisement section, it's more like my personal experience, uh, what really draw my attention to it. Uh, and So this was more a casual test uh, uh, that I can talk about. Uh, so 280 megabits down, uh, 50 plus megabits up, uh, and uh, very nice uh, latency figures. Um, power was not something uh, that you would be concerned of. So this is the, the high power antenna setup. Uh, the consumer thing is more or less equal, uh, but uh, works really nice. So uh, after all, uh, it draws little power. Uh, it has high performance uh, and ping is uh, super cool. Uh, I see ping rates uh, of like uh, 30 to 60 milliseconds. Uh, which, which is a very uh, good performance even in a mobile uh, network setting. So, uh, wow, uh, how does that work? Why does it work? And uh, what makes it so amazing? So, uh, just from a technology perspective, I, I tried to condense it a little bit. Uh, wh what do we want to have? We want to have uh, a user terminal and a ground terminal, and there's one or multiple satellites uh, flying uh, above in the skies, and uh, somehow this gets connected to the internet. Uh, so easy peasy, nothing super complex. Obviously, behind the scenes, uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, stuff happening. Um, but also, uh, we, we see now that these uh, mega constellations are popping up, uh, and every couple of weeks uh, we hear a new announcement uh, uh, with even uh, bigger numbers of how many satellites we're expecting to see. So, 
the world is changing here. In previous times, we had uh, the Iridium, the Viasat, and also SAS as players uh, that were mostly uh, working from geostationary orbit. And now uh, we have these uh, LEO, low Earth orbit constellations, like Starlink, Amazon Project Kuiper is uh, about to come, OneWeb is also up and running uh, by now. Uh, so we, we, we see a lot of players that are already there and there's much more to come. And the benefit of uh, what's happening there is they're flying really low. So low Earth orbit is anything up to 2,000 kilometers in height, whereas geostationary is like 35,000 kilometers. And you can really see the difference when you look at the calculated ping times or round trip times for signal uh, when you take into account uh, speed of light. So uh, something in the three to four milliseconds for the orbits that Starling is using, eight milliseconds uh, for what OneWeb is using, uh, O3B is like 53 milliseconds. All that is really, it feels like you're using a proper network more or less. Whereas in previous times, uh, the geostationary players had these 250, 240 milliseconds. And that is just the time it takes the signal to travel back and forth. The real problem uh, also on top of that is what's the network infrastructure and what is it just a bent pipe uh, on the satellite uh, that is just downlinking the signal uh, that is being sent to him or is it uh, networking equipment that's somewhere up in the air. So all that adds, adds latency. So just to give you a perspective uh, on how this thing works mechanically, uh, there's Newton's cannonball. So uh, the, the how do you put an, a satellite into orbit? First you need to, to launch it up there, but then it needs to be really fast. So it tries to drop down to Earth and uh, the speed of it needs to be higher, so it always misses Earth when it drops. And uh, so that, uh, w what we're aiming for is a uh, radial orbit uh, that nicely circles the Earth there. And uh, the problem you will find there is it's moving quite quickly. So uh, uh, 7,600 meters per second, uh, that's quite, quite quick. Um, and that brings uh, the next challenge. So you see the Earth and you see the antennas uh, and uh, the new generation of low Earth orbit constellations uh, tends to use uh, flat panel uh, antennas. Uh, these are really uh, marvels of uh, radio design and uh, can really do wonders and uh, be patch antennas or um, uh, Lunenburg lenses and whatever is happening there, uh, lots of development going on in that area. And the, the aim is to really drive down costs and uh, to make it more or less a consumer device. Mm, but these antennas have a field of view, and depending what technology, more or less it's 110 or 140 degrees, give or take. So uh, that's a fixed angle. And when you're looking up to the sky, the satellite passes over you and you only have a small time window of uh, like uh, 160, maybe 240 seconds, depending on the orbit, uh, where you can see what's happening. Uh, so uh, anything above the horizon is not of interest to you. You don't want to use that because uh, th there's more attenuation and uh, also the antennas have some limits on uh, how fast they can steer the beam uh, electronically. And uh, so uh, clever calculations going on there. And uh, depending on the orbit, how high you fly, uh, it more or less tells you how many satellites you need. So you end up making your calculations. How do I build a constellation? And you come up uh, with quite exciting numbers depending on what your orbit is, what your business model is, what kind of customers you're serving. Um, so you tend to build a uh, uh, Walker Delta constellation uh, where you space uh, the separate shells uh, around the globe and they fly around the globe and you uh, uh, define more or less when you're designing that uh, how many uh, segments uh, are flying at the same time. 
and uh, you can also have them fly over the polar region uh, if your customers are up into Arctic and Antarctic uh, business, whatever that is. And you can also stagger them, and that comes in, becomes of interest, uh, for example, when you want to communicate between your satellites. Uh, we come later to that. Um, so that's the key uh, factor for dimensioning your uh, minimum viable constellation. The next uh, factor that's on, uh, that adds on to that is um, what business do you expect? So what bandwidth uh, do you have? Where do you expect your customers to be? Uh, how big will be your cells uh, that you're serving? Uh, and that also comes down to where are your customers? So you design your network uh, also where the customers are. So you want to have uh, pops that uh, exfiltrate the user traffic to the internet, but also you want to have gateways that are more or less close to the customer so that the, uh, uh, the, the, the uh, distance of travel for the signal uh, can be optimized. And there is lo lots of thinking. For example, in Germany, currently we have two uh, gateway stations, uh, whereas in the US, uh, where there seems to be more customers for, for Starlink, uh, there are many more stations. Um, what you also can do is um, to route the traffic uh, between satellites. And that becomes very interesting and useful when you're, uh, for example, serving the marine industry. I uh, recently spoke to a guy that's uh, uh, working with oil platforms and he said, wow, uh, Leo is just a godsend for me. Uh, I've been uh, really ripped off uh, for, for nothing, like two megabits, uh, and uh, always could saturate that link. And now we can really do remote uh, management. We can do even a Teams call from our, our, our rig. And for cost, that's uh, next to nothing compared to what uh, they paid pr in previous times. So how do you reach these remote areas? Uh, you just hand over uh, hop to hop uh, via the satellites that are uh, orbiting in Earth. So it's uh, uh, just another opportunity to have a network mesh uh, flying above our heads. So when you launch a satellite, what happens? First of all, you uh, shoot them up. We probably many have watched these uh, SpaceX or whatever videos, uh, and then uh, the satellite gets released. Uh, and that's not the final orbit usually. Uh, they are staged there and then they are uh, checked uh, if they work and then they are uh, raised in the orbit and you remember the picture we saw about these orbital shells. Uh, so every satellite has a pre-assigned space where it needs to end up. So uh, you need to get the timing right uh, to raise the satellites and you see uh, that this tends to work. And uh, for example, in this case, uh, uh, the fa famous Jonathan McDowell uh, uh, is the data pope uh, for anything satellite related. Uh, he's creating all these cool graphs, uh, so definitely uh, needs uh, that mentioning here. Um, but uh, what also can happen is uh, that the satellites do not reach their orbit. Uh, there's been, uh, in, in the uh, left part of the scale, you see lots of satellites dropping out. So what happened, uh, we had a sunstorm. So the solar activity warmed up the Earth atmosphere, um, which resulted in additional drag. So the atmosphere expanded and the satellites uh, got slower and slower. You remember uh, Newton's cannon, uh, that didn't work out well. Uh, so many just returned to Earth uh, before they uh, could be placed in the uh, destination orbit. Um, tough luck, and, uh, when, but when you're dealing with large numbers, that's something that just happens. Um, but also when you're putting new technology into uh, the game. Uh, just recently, uh, SpaceX launched a new version, the V2 Mini, and uh, that cohort uh, also had some issues uh, that needed to be resolved. So uh, some of them uh, were raised, and then they were lowering their orbit. Some, some were already deorbiting, and some uh, probably uh, could uh, fix their issues, and then they reached orbit. Um, but that, that batch uh, didn't look too well. Um, but usually, uh, 
if, if you look at it, it's more a mixed bag. Some uh, make it, some don't make it. Um, and you see that uh, the, the numbers, it, it's in the lower 1% range uh, that uh, doesn't really make it. Uh, so overall, in the bigger scheme of things, uh, it's not such a tough loss. Um, you, you also see uh, the difference between, uh, for example, Starling and OneWeb. And uh, where Starlink seems to be uh, also very much focused on consumer business, OneWeb uh, seems to be more focused on a reseller B2B business and uh, also uh, has a lower density of satellites there. Um, but that also tells you about what's the maximum throughput of the total constellation or the maximum throughput you can get uh, when many consumers subscribe in a certain area uh, to that service. Uh, so lots, lots of arbitrage happening here. And uh, another uh, thing is service availability. You need to liaise with every regulator in every market, every, every country, country you want to serve because they want to uh, uh, have their say. You're not uh, uh, sub uh, generating subscribers. Uh, so uh, probably some have heard about the Iran story that uh, 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 SpaceX was asked uh, to allow people to use it in Iran, even though it's not being sold in Iran. So what, what's happening is, well, uh, the Emirates and other places seem to be interesting. Uh, places to, to ship stuff uh, in that area. Um, but it, slowly it's, it's growing and uh, just in the last two weeks, I guess, Malaysia was added. Uh, so uh, it, it's all moving quite swiftly. And even right now, if you look uh, at the uh, satellite tracker sites, usually you, you see like 10, 12, 15 even satellites that have a line of sight between you and the gateway. So for the terminal you're having, it has a lot of choice which satellite to talk to. And it's not a given that uh, always the shortest path is used. So uh, there's l lots of scheduling and algorithms uh, working there uh, just to, from a constellation perspective, uh, manage the traffic uh, as best as possible. And the satellites also move, uh, and they also can avoid, for example, running into other satellites. Uh, so how do you get that data? And there's some cool companies out there uh, that, like Leo Labs, and they basically use something that was used in, in science for ionospheric science radars. Uh, they were tracking satellites, and uh, because they needed to uh, more or less uh, sub, sub subtract that information and found out that the sub subtraction was more uh, of a business. Um, so uh, there's a lot of uh, data providers that tell you where at any given point in time a satellite is and uh, what the trajectory of that satellite will be. So you can forecast over time, uh, is there the risk of a conjunction? And then you need to move your satellite and hopefully you get enough uh, fuel left over so you can replace uh, it, move it upwards, downwards, uh, 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 just to avoid any, uh, any traffic collisions, which is not something you want to have happening because that very quickly spoils, uh, has the chance to spoil your whole orbit. So, w what's the key uh, advances that are happening? Yeah. Um, again, this is not a SpaceX uh, sales show, but uh, certainly these guys uh, moved the needle quite significantly, um, both with their Falcon 9 and uh, potentially uh, with their Starship. So, um, the reusability and the launch cadence that they can launch even multiple flights uh, per week uh, is, is truly impressive and uh, that has not happened before and that's really what is the game changer in all of this. And if you look at the cost to orbit, uh, that's a key indicator how much it costs to send one kilogram into low Earth orbit. Um, you see that uh, uh, more or less uh, the, the uh, cost to orbit has remained the same, give or take uh, 10,000, uh, 12,000 uh, dollars per kilogram. 
and you can have serious and long discussions about the validity of this data. Trust me, you don't want to really dig down deep into this. Uh, the, you, you come into discussions uh, that maybe even reusability doesn't work and raises costs, whatever. But uh, just um, as a key indicator uh, for the calculation, it's how much does it cost me to send one kilogram up to orbit and uh, also for a given size. So we're not talking about these small cube sets, uh, but solid uh, piece of kit, not like a geostationary uh, one that's uh, tons, but uh, hundreds of kilograms. So, and uh, over time, uh, if you highlight that, uh, the, these guys are really rocking the boat by lowering or saying they will be able to lower costs uh, by orders of magnitude. I don't know how this plays out. We all know these uh, Elon Musk announcements. But if that becomes true, that really changes the game uh, for anything happening in space. And that's what's really, really impressive right now. Um, in the meantime, uh, there's quite some uh, supply gap in the market because uh, uh, there's lots of constellations trying to get their stuff up in the air, uh, hundreds and thousands of satellites, and also uh, Russia not being able uh, to launch uh, currently. So there is a supply gap, and uh, even worse, uh, if you have a constellation, uh, the, the key limiting factor is the frequencies you use there. Uh, and you had to apply for these and the licenses usually say you need to be able uh, to demonstrate that you have like 50% of your constellation up and running and are using these frequencies. However, uh, there's a supply gap right now and uh, many players in the market are currently battling uh, with that. So, uh, very interesting times and some uh, extensions are uh, uh, being granted right now, but that's, uh, uh, yeah. And uh, certainly uh, there is someone who can profit from that, um, w w uh, but yeah, there is someone who can profit from that. If, if you look at the uh, absolute figures of uh, how many large objects were being put into space. Uh, that's from end of last year. You really see uh, that there has been an explosion. Uh, and the, the growth rate is just uh, never happened before in, in history. So these uh, mega constellations really change also the, the demand on, on the uh, space launch site. And, uh, at least uh, until end of last year, uh, the dominant player uh, was not OneWeb. Mm, and customers seem to like that. Uh, so there, there's good growth. Um, well, 1.5 million Starlink subscribers. Uh, in, in the bigger scheme of things, uh, that's not something that really moves the needle when you're working in telco. But anyhow, that's uh, strong growth that's happening right now. And that's also being uh, shown in, uh, in the valuation. Um, don't want to go deep into that one. Uh, it, it's really crazy what's happening there. A company that's worth 150 billion, and um, the, the key value driver for that is not uh, the rocket business of SpaceX, but also certainly uh, the uh, Starlink business. But there's others there. So uh, just to give you an image, uh, Amazon uh, will probably end of this year, early uh, next year, uh, demonstrate their service. And uh, what they showed as terminals looks really nice. And if you look at the size of it, um, the small one, that's really neat. You can put it next to your uh, coffee mug and uh, feel cozy somewhere out in the woods. Um, but uh, there's also other ones that are more geared towards uh, business uses. Uh, for example, what OneWeb you, uh, ordered from Hughes. So uh, th there's lots of stuff happening and also on the terminal side. So expect terminals, to, uh, the antennas to become much smaller, much more lightweight. Also power consumption will go down. Uh, there's serious development happening right there. Um, but certainly that has some security implications. And you might have heard about the Viasat hack uh, that happened on the first day when Ukraine was attacked. 
you saw the traffic dropping there, and uh, what happened there was that um, uh, some uh, malware uh, was used, and uh, that they access uh, uh, VSAT via a, as they state, poorly configured VPN, and uh, then were able to move into the network and the, the management network, and then into the part that's uh, able to control the. Uh, software uh, downloads and unfortunately uh, there was some collateral damage uh, so like 11 gigawatts in uh, wind turbines uh, were left without uh, being controllable uh, because they were using VSAT uh, so that's a bit unfortunate and uh, there may be uh, reasons uh, why you want to be able to control that so um, you see things are happening, and that's government actors here. And uh, yes, uh, if, if you read uh, what's really uh, being talked there, uh, there might have been some Fortinet VPN appliances involved, and the uh, question is, was that patched, and has uh, anybody learned from previous attacks on these devices? Um, usual security practice uh, should be applied there. And uh, yes, uh, there's more moving targets in there, like ground station operators. Uh, some are controlling everything in their value chain. Others are using existing players in that market, um, also like distributors, resellers, and everyone needs to have access uh, to parts of the network. Another one uh, happening recently was Dozo Teleport. Uh, that's a Russian provider uh, that works for, for the military. And uh, that was attacked uh, uh, for a couple of days ago. Um, and uh, there were, uh, was data ex exfiltrated and um, not, not such a long time it was off if you look at the data. But uh, what was exfiltrated believe it or not, um, because uh, it was attributed to Wagner, but uh, some would say that that should be taken with uh, more than a grain of salt. Um, some basic infrastructure, how a uh, satellite uh, provider works. So lots of interesting data out there, if you fancy uh, looking into that. Um, there's also um, official uh, uh, hackathons going on, so Hackersat uh, just happened and also ESA uh, did some uh, hack SciSet uh, with Thales, uh, that was very interesting to watch uh, what happened there, so ESA provided a uh, dummy satellite, uh, a real satellite and Hackersat uh, just uh, also used a real satellite this time. Um, so uh, th there was an exercise being done, uh, how can you hack a satellite and uh, 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 even though that is a platform uh, where you can more or less register your payload that gets uploaded and executed, you can download the pictures, whatever, um, you, you can gain control if you know how. And uh, the intrusion uh, more or less persisted uh, the, the threat there and uh, so if that would have been some uh, uh, uncontrolled environment, this was all uh, friendly uh, work that was done, uh, that's not so nice to have happening. Um, but that's nothing new, so uh, there's lots of stories on how uh, r satellites were hacked over the years uh, and uh, even satellites were, bring, were brought down and uh, crashed back to Earth. So wh what do you do? Uh, first of all, don't trust uh, the network. Uh, it may be compromised as any other network. Uh, and certainly do not assume availability, for example, if you're running wind turbines and always uh, also use encryption uh, uh, if you're doing that. And maybe even uh, look if the network looks trustworthy for you over time, like uh, some crazy BGP stuff happening. Um, so, but from, from a hacker's perspective, um, this is not a new thing. Um, you may remember... Uh, uh, Captain Midnight uh, that was jamming the 
uh, the, the cable TV signal uh, back in the US uh, or Max Headroom uh, where some guy uh, uh, broadcast uh, signals up to the satellite that was distributing. And not that long ago, uh, some in, in the Czech Republic, uh, you remember these uh, 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 TV channels where uh, uh, a camera is panning over nice landscapes, so that uh, should stimulate tourism. Uh, some some uh, folks uh, changed that and uh, also uh, showed some nuclear explosion in that imagery, so that raised an eyebrow or two. Um, but I mentioned that earlier, there's lots of attack vectors here. So there's the end user uh, devices, the router, the antenna uh, that's being used. And uh, that's all in the hands of many, many, many people. So security, security researchers as well. But you can also have a look at uh, all the internal uh, structure. Uh, so we talked about the uh, uh, command and control that's necessary uh, to keep the constellation at work, the, uh, uh, the uh, collision avoidance that's happening there. So that's absolutely critical and uh, of highest importance to keep alive. But there's lots of other uh, customer-facing systems like uh, uh, billing, whatever, uh, or websites uh, that allow for interesting uh, work. Um, but, y you know, what I want to convey is the message. There's lots of lots, lots and lots of uh, moving wheels in this whole thing. It's a highly complex thing, and I, I'm, I'm even tending to compare it to what's happening in a mobile network. It's, it's really super complex, and you can uh, even look at physical uh, avenues of co making contact. And I uh, don't know if you can see that. That's not uh, a James Bond movie. Uh, that's a mission that's uh, uh, due to happen in the not too distant future uh, by ESA. Uh, that's going to capture a satellite, and you will see many more players in that field that, for example, will be refueling satellites or uh, repositioning satellites. So uh, th there's uh, interesting stuff happening in that arena. But uh, you can also uh, be more down to earth and ju just just use uh, open source intelligence. So if, uh, when a player is, for example, applying for licenses uh, with a local council to build a gateway, uh, they make nice presentations and tell you uh, how these antennas work, uh, how much power is being used. Mm, one of the more interesting pieces of work uh, in the recent time was done by Leonard Wouters uh, in, uh, at Black Hat. Uh, so he was glitching uh, the older version of the Starlink terminal uh, and uh, more or less uh, achieved full control of that one. Uh, very nice uh, attack and uh, so... Uh, he, he was able to uh, uh, get root uh, and uh, be persistent there and also uh, uh, played fairly with Starlink and also Starlink moved very uh, swiftly and uh, professional on that side. Um, there's this interesting work on uh, uh, reverse engineering the network infrastructure. So uh, uh, PAN and others are, are measure, measuring uh, latency and trace routes uh, at scale uh, so they can uh, have a decent information on how this works. And uh, you can make your uh, in, uh, inferences on how the network and the backhaul backlinks look like. Um, there's also interesting work happening on how the Starlink scheduler works. Um, and it uh, turns out uh, that what has been circulating through Reddit and whatever, uh, there is a 15-second uh, uh, scheduling window uh, in the terminal. Uh, and uh, every 15 seconds, uh, the terminal might pick a new satellite. And you see... Uh, this uh, difference in ping situation happening there. And uh, you see also that uh, different devices or MAC addresses might be treated differently, uh, possibly in their internal routing happening there. Um, interesting work. Um, also, uh, for example, which satellites are being preferred? So they uh, 
looked at the uh, obstruction maps uh, in the Starlink terminal. Uh, so the terminal uh, maps the trajectory of a satellite to find out if there are any obstructions in, uh, in its field of vision. And they found uh, that more or less uh, it tends to use uh, anything with an inclination of 45 to 90 degrees. Um, there may be variances depending on where the terminal is and also uh, for example, there's a, an exclusion zone. You don't want your Starlink uh, to uh, beam into the geostationary orbit because there's some frequency reuse happening there. Um, another uh, way of uh, getting information about that provider's uh, work by Microsoft, uh, where they looked at uh, screenshots from speed tests uh, posted on Reddit and also the user sentiment happening there. So they found out uh, that uh, uh, speed uh, seemed to decrease or uh, latency uh, seemed to uh, increase over time and now it's uh, going down uh, as the constellation is expanding. So there's lots of alternative ways uh, to, to look at that. And uh, another one was how to break the service. There uh, was a way to uh, 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 tell the terminal um, to uh, via GPRC uh, to stall the antenna and then break the router and more or less that uh, made it incapable of uh, uh, being uh, without uh, power cycling uh, being used again. Uh, there's a nice uh, SSH uh, uh, console available uh, or not available with a nice greeting and uh, there's also bug bounty programs uh, from OneWeb. Uh, SpaceX is doing the same. And that also, um, le let's say, that gives in inspiration uh, on where to look uh, or hopefully not to look. And also, uh, OneWeb is doing that. So I'm speeding up a little. Um, yeah, lots of interesting things happening here. And there's one more thing. Um, Mobile is going satellite as well, and uh, you may have heard about uh, T-Mobile uh, cooperating with uh, Starlink, uh, and there's other players out in that market uh, that will uh, more or less fly base stations over your head, and that's also happening in the standardization circuit of 3GPP that is defining uh, 5G, uh, 6G, 7G over time. Uh, expect lots of interesting stuff to happen there uh, because uh, that will provide uh, mobile access uh, pretty much all around the globe. So, complex systems, uh, many angles of attack, uh, uh, lots of uncharted territory. Uh, so this is more an invitation uh, from my point of view to, to look into this and uh, because over time the importance of these mega constellations will be high and I expect uh, the services to grow and I'd rather have them safe and sound and work uh, well and uh, not being shut down uh, uh, by, for example, uh, military aggressors. Um, so overall I'm, I'm super excited, excited what's going on right now. Um, uh, really attractive uh, products coming out. Uh, I, I would expect that Amazon uh, will be a aggressive uh, and uh, value-driven uh, consumer offer. Reali reliability is high. It, it works. Uh, I'm a happy farmer using that, and I'm being shown the five uh, minutes uh, sign now. So I'm opening up uh, for questions now. So, are there any questions? In, we have microphones, and if you have a question, then wait for the microphone so the stream can also hear you. Anyone? Yes. Hello. It might be a dummy question. Sorry for that. Uh, can you speak up? Uh, there's lots of. <laughs> okay. Uh, I wonder that uh, why other satellites have a fixed. Uh, um, Orbit uh, scope, like uh, the web one is 1,000 kilometers, etc. But uh, the space thing is 350 to 550 yes. kilometers. So why is that? 
why is the difference all the time? Like, is there any explanation of that? Um, th 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 there, these are just considerations, I guess, on how much bandwidth you want to provide in your constellation. And if you fly lower, you more or less can put more satellites in your shells and uh, create less interference uh, between. Repeat the question. He was in the microphone. That was that was not a question. So you said it yourself. The economic viability is not yet proven. So, so you said it yourself. The economic viability is not yet really proven. So do you see a way that this whole crumbles again when it's not going to be profitable in any, any way? It's a big bet. Uh, you're asking uh, um, about the economic viability. Um, that needs to be proven. Uh, people need to buy that service and uh, pay good money for that. And I expect uh, uh, there will be dropouts in that game. And there already have been dropouts. And uh, it's a highly competitive space. Um, so I'm not making any bets right now. Um, however, there seems to be huge confidence uh, from the financial community, at least in some players, uh, that they're investing money there. So they have maybe found the magic formula there. And, and perhaps the last question from the gentleman with the ESA cap. Just so happens. Um, yeah, you, you said that you were using the Starlink uh, user terminals from the moving car at German autobahn speeds, which can be scary high. Um, did, as far as I understand, that's not actually supported. So, um, did you see any weird effects? Did they detect that you are having too high Doppler speeds and drop you out? Did you see handover issues, stuff like that? No, uh, they actually support uh, certainly certain speeds, and the, the, there's a m moving subscription there. But they also provide service for planes. So technically, uh, the, the Doppler speed uh, of a satellite passing uh, over your head uh, versus the speed I'm running on a German highway is uh, not, not, not that big, the, the delta there. So, um, but certainly, they can detect a lot. And I know that they, uh, in, the, in the early days, they uh, were not using geofencing, so were very liberal. And now they are trying to more or less slice and dice their product portfolio for different use cases, uh, which they have an, any right to do, um, even if it may be annoying for me. But uh, um, they, they have a lot of telemetry, I'm, I'm pretty sure. And you s one of the words you most used in your, your speech was market. So this marks that really there was a change from the last century when space was done by governments or international organizations like uh, NASA, and now it, it's private companies. So I have three questions. One is, do you think as these are the same Amazon and, and Elon Musk, who are already the digital feudalism of five American men defining the rules of our digital communication. Will be, this be reinforced by the satellite thing? And my second question would be, is there some... No, no, no second question. Very short. Is there some movement of people who say space should uh, be a common, which is owned by us all and not by private com companies? Uh, there, there is some legal framework there. Uh, there's the space treaty. Um, but what's happening right now uh, is not a regulated market. Uh, so it's really a first come, first serve. And there's interesting papers, is, for example, from China, uh, where they look at that highly critical and say, we must be in that game uh, in order to be able to compete. Otherwise, the orbits will all be polluted by other players, for example. Um, regarding the, um, uh, is it US only? No, uh, China, for example, will bring up a huge constellation. There's a wasp here. You go away, please, thanks. Um, there, uh, Europe will have a constellation up and running, Iris 2. Um, however, that will look like. Um, it's a bit up in the air for me, but uh, the, the tender is out now. Um, that will be more focused on, on government and uh, critical infrastructure users, um, but also uh, to provide benefits, especially for Africa. 
uh, where satellite internet certainly has a high net benefit uh, for the local communities because uh, providing high bandwidth uh, through traditional means in rural places is super costly and therefore uh, not happening in many times. So I, I see your point. Um, uh, you, you need the money to bring the satellites up there. Uh, we're talking of about billions and uh, that's where uh, market dynamics kick in. I guess that's the sad truth. Well, thank you very much. I think it was ex exceptionally good talk. Um, very interesting topic. So thank you very much for coming. And we are out of time now because the next talk um, is also uh, be here in 14 minutes now. And uh, we need some time, time to change the stage. And uh, thank you very much for coming. And if you have more questions, um, you can do it privately. I will be around here for a minute. <laughs>